Should have this finished tomorrow. Yeah. It's grand work, Adam. It'll do. You can carve like an Italian sculptor. I doubt any one of them could get finer detail than you've got there. An oak, maybe. I'd be lost with marble. If I stayed on another hour or two... Will you get night school tonight? Aye. Tomorrow will do. Oh. That is fine. Makes you think of the Bible where it says, God put his spirit into the workmen as built the tabernacle so we could master all the carved workers wanted a nice hand. It's not a tabernacle, Seth. It's a mantelpiece. And you'll be for the preaching tonight? Aye. You should come and see her, Adam. She's to preach at the green at 8 o'clock. Then I should go and hear her. You mean you will? No, but if I did, I'd go to listen, not to look. Oh, but that's what I... But it's in her face too, Adam. In her eyes. Oh, they're grey and... And what? Like she knows the truth. <laughs> Dissenter's truth. She's Methodist, so am I. And who's to say we haven't got the root of the matter as well as church folks? See, they're all put away right. You know what Mr Burge is like about the tools? Ah, it's a little cause for complaint, since we're here later than any of his other lads. So, you've got to the root of things, have you, Seth? I'm searching for it. And I wish you well. But there's such a thing as being over-spiritual. How can you have too much of God's spirit? Oh, I don't see you can. But I do believe we need something beside gospel in the world. Look at the canals and the aqueducts, the coal pit engines and Arkwright's mills there at Cromford. What have they got to do with the gospel? Little that I can see, that's my point. You need to learn more than gospel to make such things. Or to carve a mantelpiece. Aye. Now we'd best be off. I've got to go home first before I get to the school, see that our father's got that coffin finished for old Mr Toller. It's promised for the morning. Might be after ten or four I'm home. She preach a while, does she? No more than others. But I might see her safe home to the poises after. It's more than gospel truth draws you there, Seth. Am I right? It's the truth in those grey eyes of hers. Diana Morris is not for the likes of me. The likes of you? What talk's that? You haven't seen her, Adam. Or heard her. I know she's the Poyser's niece. She's Hetty's cousin. And does she not work in a mill in Snowfield? <laughs> Aye. She's as poor as us, if not poorer. Then how's she too good for a craftsman? Oh, too good and holy. Holy? For any man, like enough. <laughs> Let alone me. Seth. You haven't seen her, Adam. Here, hand the key into Mr Burge before you go. I'll tell Mother not to expect you before ten. It's gone seven, my lad. You stay at that workshop when all the rest are shifted and fed. You'll be ready for your supper. And where's Seth? Mother. Gone for some of his methody preaching, no doubt. They tell me that Dinah Morris is a preacher herself. A woman preacher. Mother, where is he? He went to Treddleston. When? For noon. And he's never come back? I don't know what's delayed him. You know fine what's delayed him. Sit down, lad. Sit and have some supper. Supper? Look! That's the wood for old Toller's coffin. Standing there just as I left it this morning, not a nail struck yet. And it's promised for the morning. There's taters with the gravy in them. They're just as you like them. Only enough for you. I saved them on purpose. There's a coffin to be made and delivered for seven o'clock in the morning. It can't be done, Adam. Eat your supper. It has to be done. It's promised. They can't bury the man without it. It would take you all night. And it'll take me all night. Oh, I've stood enough of this. More than enough. You won't leave again. Again? You ran away at four. I was 18. Got as far as Stoniton. I was back in a day and a half. Nearer two. And those two days... If were... I left now, he wouldn't be long before Father had sold every bit of timber in the yard to buy a drink. You're so hard on him, Adam. I have to be. He's a clever workman. He was. He taught you the trade. Oh, and you were so proud of him. I'm thigh as beads, lad. I can still hear you say that. I'm thigh as beads, lad. You were proud to be the son of the man that made the pigeon house at Broxton Parsonage, which was a wonder. So it was. But the days of his wonders are gone. He's never given me a blow. Not so much as an ill word. No matter how in drink he is. Is that where my pride's to be now? I'm the son of Fire Speed, who doesn't beat his wife. I'm sorry, Mother. Well, one thing I do take pride in is a promise kept. I'm going to finish his coffin for him. 
Seth will help you when he gets in. He'll be after ten before he's home. He's gone to hear this cousin of Hetty's preach. <laughs> she must be unlike Hetty if she's a Methody preacher in her black dress and Quaker cap. Aye. And Rachel and Martin Poison must be right vexed. Her niece of theirs making a fool of herself that way. A woman preacher. I'll save these taters. They'll take another warming up. Seth might walk her home to the Poisers' farm. The preacher? Aye. Walk her home? For why? She's good and holy. And she's got grey eyes. Yes, friends, we can. Because he came among us. He came in a body like ours. He spoke as we speak to each other. And he preached out of doors to the poor. He made friends of poor workmen, taught them and took pains with them. He gave comfort to those who had lost their friends, and he wept with them. Jesus, my friends, came in the image of the Father. Jesus has shown us what God's heart is. And they spat on him, they scourged him, and they nailed him to a cross. His lips parched with thirst, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It'd break my heart if you went away again. One heartbreak like that's enough for any mother. And would you have them carry me to the churchyard and you not there to follow me? That's not going to happen, Mother. I couldn't rest if I don't see you at the last. Seth would be away along with you, no doubt. And your father not able to write and let you know. Not able to hold a pen for his hands shaking. And maybe he wouldn't even know where you were. Mother... Why don't you go up to bed? I'll stay till Seth gets in. It'd be easier if you're in bed when Father gets home. He might not come home till the morning now. Uh, is Seth courting this Methody preaching woman? I wouldn't say courting, but he's taken with her, I'm sure of that. But he said nothing. I doubt it. I doubt he'll need to. That face of his can't hide much. I doubt she's too holy to read what's in it. Bad enough when he took up with them Methodies. But if he marries one of them, a preaching woman. And she's a cousin to Etty Sorrel. That's right. Another niece of the Poisers. Aye. And have you spoken to her? Mother. Or is she to read what's in your face as well? Seth. Look at your brother here, still at his work while you're away at your preaching and courting. He forgot the coffin. Aye, the old tale. I suppose you'll have had your supper with your methody folks. No. At the Poisers, maybe. I haven't had supper, Mother. Warm broth and oat cake. Grand. There's taters and gravy, but only enough for Adam. The broth will be grand, Mother. Right. Come through, then. You didn't get to your night school. No, I can wait. This needs doing for the morning. How was your grey-eyed preacher? Mm, she speaks the way some folks can sing. And you walked her back to the poisers? Aye. And? She's leaving soon. Gone home to Snowfield. Not before you see her again. Uh, you go and rest, Adam. Have your taters and gravy. Let me do an hour at this. I'd rather go on now, I'm in harness. You go and have your supper. I want to help. You can help me carry it to Broxton. We'll have to leave at sunrise. Right. And you can help by closing the door so I can't hear Mother. He's been threatening to leave again. He'll go some morning afore I'm up and never let me know aforehand. He won't do that. And he'll never come back. He won't leave, Mother. And you'll go with him. If he'd been going to leave, he'd have gone afore now. He did go afore. For a day and a bit. And he was just a lad. Since then, look how he's worked. Worked for all of us, for Father. Every spare bit of money Adam's made has gone to buy timber for Father so that Father too could work. And shouldn't a son? Shouldn't he work for his father? Of course he should. But there's many a man earning the money Adam is would have enough put by to think of marrying by now. Oh, don't talk to me about his marrying. It is sorrel. He set his heart on Etty's sorrel. We can't love just where other folks would want us to. She'll never save a penny. All she'll do is toss up a curly long hair at us. She's as much use as a gillyflower on the wall as Etty's sorrel. There's nobody but God can control the heart of a man. 
Mm. And is God directing yours to this Dinah Morris? Dinah Morris and Etty's sorrel. A preaching woman and a gillyflower. Are these to be my daughters? I think you'd... Had what? I think you'd admire Dinah. Mm, admire, would I? Well, there's not much these days to... Is there a chill in here? I don't feel it chilly. What is it, son? The theatres are still there. Son? Who was at the door? No one. I thought... What did you hear, son? A knock. I thought I heard a knock at the door. No. Go out and look. We'd have heard it, Mother. Go out and look. Dead and drowned. Look at him. Drowned in the brook we passed over the day we were married and come home together. First thing he did was make shelves for me to put my plates and things on. He showed them to me as proud as could be. Still there, them shelves, and some of the plates as well. And when I was ill and cumbered with the babby, and he made me the posset and brought it upstairs, he was as proud as could be. As proud as he was of the pigeon house at Broxton Parsonage, and that was a wonder. Was it not a wonder, Adam? Aye, Mother, it was. Look at him. Shall I make another pot of tea, Mother? No. What's the use of tea? What's the use of drinking or eating? When one end of the bridge falls down, what's the use of the other end standing? Look at him. Dead and drowned in the same water. Mother? <laughs> is there anyone I can fetch from the village? Who? I don't know. Someone who might be a help, a comfort. Mr Earl won't be here, of course. But I thought... Uh, there's no one, son. I'll still have to deliver the coffin and... And then make another. So I thought... Mm. There's no one. Well, I, I could fetch Dinah. Dinah? I know she'd come. <laughs> you think I need a Dinah, Morris? You'd find her a comfort, I'm sure. A preaching woman. Good evening, sister. The Lord has sent me to see if I might comfort you. The Lord sent you? This is Dinah, mother. Dinah Morris. Aye. But I thought it was my boy here that sent for you, not the Lord. When Seth told me about your trouble, I knew I had to come. I believe the Lord told me I must. The Lord talks to you. Doesn't he talk to us all, mother? The still, small voice. You're a Methody, like Seth. That's right. A follower of Mr. Wesley. I was raised in the society. Methodist, Wesley societies. <laughs> what comfort can they be to me? I'm for the church. Mr. Irwin's my rector. We try to help anyone in need, Mother. If they'll take our help. Well, you can help by going outside and cutting some wood. I'll do that. And try to keep it quiet. Your brother's asleep. I will. Will you take my hand? Here now. You're a working woman. I work in a cotton mill. Feels like you've never worn a glove in your life. No, I don't think I ever have. You'll know how to make a pot of tea then. Yes. I'll try to be a daughter to you tonight if you'd let me. First I'm your sister, now I'm your mother. Is the tea all right? It'll do. 
Adam was up all night finishing a coffin and then taking it all the way to Broxton. And there was another to make. So we must let him sleep while he can. Aye. I wonder when I'll close my eyes again. I'll stay with you tonight if you like. And preach me to sleep? No. No preaching tonight. I could make breakfast for you all in the morning and see the house is all in order. I'm an able enough housekeeper. I can believe that. You're unlike your cousin, Etty. You and your black gown and her in a pink frock. She's very pretty, is Etty. So could you be. But you seem to have a serious thought or two in your head. Etty's very young, but she works well enough with some direction. She's a good help to our aunt, and I'm fond of her. So's Adam. Yes. She told you? Not directly, but something she said, and Seth too. Why? I to imagine a nuzzy like that as my daughter. She'll grow, Elizabeth. She'll learn. Mm-hmm. When I do imagine it, I imagine trouble between her and me. I'll be an ailing widow with a troubling daughter. But then, do you Methodists not say we should welcome trouble? That it's through our sorrows we grow and learn? <laughs> There's truth in that, I think. Well, if your society's that fond of trouble, it's a pity you can't take it all. Take it from them that don't like it so much. I could have given you plenty over the years. And now my two boys have to make their own father's coffin. Why don't you let me take you upstairs now, help you to bed? Aye. I'll maybe try and get an hour or two. They both take porridge in the morning. Fine. I always put a sprig of thyme in it. Then so will I. Is your brother angry if his papers are moved? If they're not put back right. Oh. How do you do, Adam Bede? Diana Morris. Yes. Good morning to you. I'm sorry if I startled you. Oh, n- no, I wasn't. It was just that Seth was here and I was going to wipe down this table. Hi. It was good of you to come and see my mother. I hope she was thankful to have you. I think so, yes. I'm glad. She has a way of not liking young women. She seemed comforted after a while. She managed to sleep off and on. She was fast when I left her. And you? Me? Have you not slept? A little. Enough. And I hope you were rested to bear the burden and the heat of the day. (laughs) It's a bonny phrase, that. It's from Matthew, chapter 20. I know it. Where the last shall be first and the first last. And you knew these were my books and papers? Seth has told me how keen you are on night school. Aye, I'm eager to learn. It's a changing world. You're going home to Snowfield soon? In a day or two. To bear the burden and heat of a cotton mill? (sighs) Yes. But I'd been ill and came to stay with my aunt for a while. I'm strong enough now to go back and to go on with my work for the society. Seth told me you speak as others sing. When you're preaching, like. I simply speak the words that are given to me. They're given to you? They come out as tears come. And they always come? No, not always. I'd best see to the porridge. God forgive me, Seth, but it was my first thought, or near enough, when I saw him in the water. Oh, there's no shame in it, Adam. I've been thinking he'd live to be a thorn in my side, and in yours and mother's for long years yet. That was how I was seeing our father, drunkard and a thorn in our sides. When maybe at that moment he was struggling face down in them. Adam. And then I heard that rap at the door. One rap like a willow wand. You don't believe in such omens. Maybe I don't, but I heard it. I don't wonder at you loving her, Seth. She's got a face like a lily. I do love her. But I don't think she'll ever love any man. Not as a husband. Have you spoken to her? (laughs) No. Then you can't be sure. It's plain enough she's made out of stuff with a finer grain than most women. But if she's better than most in other things, maybe she won't fall short of them in loving. Talk to her. Well, maybe I'll, I'll walk her back to the Poises farm again. Aye, do that. She may be a good and holy woman, but she is a woman. She blushes like a woman. Blushes? Aye. I've never seen Dinah blush. I have this morning. I came in behind her and she thought it was you. And she blushed? Like a woman. Seth, 
I'll be leaving soon, and your mother wants you to fetch down China from a cupboard upstairs. China? She'll want the best for the rector. All oh, right. Oh, and, and Dinah. Yes? I was hoping I might walk with you back to the Poises, since this Thank might you, be the last. Seth. I'd like that. Oh. The china upstairs is so much the best it's never been used. I think my mother had hoped it would be brought out for a wedding, mine or Seth's. I'll say farewell to you now, Adam Bede. Hi. I hope all goes well with you at Snowfield. Is there any word you'd have me carry to the farm? No. I'll be seeing them there soon. I'll miss my aunt and uncle when I go. Hetty too. Aye, but you'll be back. I hope so. But there's much to do at Snowfield. Well, I hope your words are given to you often. Maybe some will come as smiles, not as tears. It's a strange thing. That a mystery. That a strong man can tremble, can turn hot and cold. That a look from just one woman. I mean, that woman and no other. But that's how Adam is. His heart is set on Hetty Sorrow. Then we must hope she'll make him happy. Can you think she will? I know she's your cousin, Dinah. As I told your mother, she's young. Not 19 yet. Aye. And you, Dinah? Me? What are your thoughts on marrying? For myself. For, for yourself? My heart said another way. I'll live and die without husband or children. Because you're cold? Yes, I am. To rejoice with them that rejoice, weep with those that weep. My own life is too short. God's work is too great. Oh, I'd work for you. While you did God's work. Working for you would be God's work. Seth. But I'd work indoors and out. To give you your liberty. You'd have more than you have now. Because now you have to make your own living. I'd work for both of us. I'm strong enough. I know you are, Seth. Well, and, and doesn't St Paul say, I will, that the young women marry? Yes, he does. And it's a great and blessed thing to be a wife and mother. And he says two are better than one. Seth, I thank you for your love. I can wait. I'd wait seven years, like Jacob did for Rachel. You may see things different after a while. You may hear a different call. No. No, Seth. My heart isn't free to marry. Good day to you, Adam. And to you, sir. What I'd call in on my way to the whole farm uh, to offer my condolences. Thank you, sir. He was a fine craftsman in his day. Ah, he was. How is your mother? Not too bad. She's resting now. Sleeps half an hour now and then, in between cleaning the house from attic to cellar. When is the funeral? Sunday. Me and Seth have the coffin nearly made. Ah, you're making his coffin yourself. Aye, mother wants it. Shall I fit you out a mug of beer, sir? Uh, no, thanks, Adam. I won't stay long. I've been thinking... Sir? ...about what this might mean for your future. Yours and mine. Our future, sir. It's no secret that while your father was alive, you were... Well, you were constrained in the work you could take on. I don't follow. Like the work you do for Burge. It's well enough paid now I'm his foreman. I'm sure it is. But if Burge has any sense, he'll want you as a partner, not a foreman. But for that, he'll be looking for someone who can put some money into the business. And we know for the last few years you've had none to spare. That's true. Well, that could change now. And for me, now that I'm of age... I'll have more of an allowance. When I've uh, paid off a debt or two, I'll have money to invest. That's kind of you, sir. Oh, it's not entirely selfless. I'd gladly help if it means you're settled on the estate. I have no plans to leave. Good. Because when my grandfather dies and I'm the landlord here, there are changes I want to make. Have you heard of Arthur Young? Aye. I've read one of his books at night school. Have you indeed? And do you like his ideas and the management of land? I do. Well, when I inherit from my grandfather, who's too set in his way, splendid old fellow that he is, I intend to put those ideas into practice. I'm glad to hear it. And I want you to manage my woods. I want you as my right hand. I'm honoured, sir. Well, thinking about you in this new trouble of yours, it's brought back a lot of memories. Of you and I as boys. 
Do you remember those days? Of course. I could still see you riding around on a pony as big as a sheep. <laughs> when I'd grown out of being carried on your back. And I still have the two-foot rule you bought me with your pocket money. I still use it. I remember standing in a circle of other boys, cheering you on in a fight with some scallywag. I haven't done that for some years. Since you were 17, and you laid up Gil Tranter for a fortnight. Hi. My temper took me over. Which is why I... You now resist the temptation. I don't think I'll fight any man again. Unless it's an outright scoundrel. And when you and I are running the state together, you can help me resist. I don't take you for a fighter, sir. Oh, I did a bit of boxing at Oxford. And I mean, uh, well, I don't always have your resolution in other matters. Maybe I'm too far the other way. And I've said a thing, even only to myself, it's hard for me to go back. Too resolute, maybe. We might make up our minds not to pick any cherries and keep our hands in our pockets to make sure we don't. But we can't keep our mouths from watering, can we? Maybe not, sir. But I must go. My best wishes to your mother and Seth. Thank you again. You're for the whole farm? Yes, with Mr. Irwin. Uh, Poiser has some new pups he wants us to look at. Maybe you'll see Poiser's niece. Hetty. Well, I should imagine there's every chance I'll see Hetty. No, not Hetty. Dinah. Dinah Morris. Ah, well. Good day, Adam. And to you, sir. I'm keen to see this young woman again, Arthur. You've seen her before? No more than a glimpse. She has quite an uncommon face, like St. Catherine in a Quaker dress. And do you wish to see her again in your capacity as a clergyman or as a magistrate? What do you mean? Oh, she's been preaching in your parish, to your congregation, and these dissenters have been known to stir up unrest in working people. I'm told she spoke only of God's love. Uh, will that be her there, with Mrs. Poyser? That's her. Adam Bede seemed to think her worth seeing. Good day to you, Mrs. Poyser. And to you, Mr. Irwin. Captain, sir, will you step down and take some tea? It's your husband I'm after, Mrs. Poyser. Ah, he has some uh, pups to show me. Well, Poyser ain't here, sir. He's gone to Rossiter to see about the wool. But I can take you round myself to see the whelps. Did you want to see them too, Mr. Irwin? No, thank you, Mrs. Poyser. I have all the dogs I need for now. But I would accept that cup of tea. Then here's Dinah will take you in, sir, as Hetty's in the dairy making the butter. Good day to you, Miss Morris. Mr. Irwin, Captain Donnithorne. Happy to meet you, Miss Morris. The farm looks in splendid order. Thank you, sir. Better than any other for ten miles around. If you weren't the best tenants we have, I'd be tempted to ask my grandfather to move you on. Move us on, sir? The captain's having fun with you, Mrs. Poyser. But can't you see it, Irwin? I do up this fine old house and turn farmer myself. Wouldn't that be fun? It's no fun in the farming, sir. No fun toiling and striving with never a spare penny, up early and down late. At the end of the year, it can be like you've cooked a feast, and all you get for your pains you sell is a smell of it. Well, that does sound less than fun. Miss Morris, will you take me in for that tea? Of course, sir. This way. And I'll take you round to the kennel, sir. Good, but I'd like to see your dairy first. Oh, it ain't in a fit state for you, sir. The churning were thrown late and Hetty's there trying to catch up. Oh, I'm sure it's in capital order and I've never seen it. Um, through here, is it? <sighs> of course, only a certain amount of milk can be spared for butter and cheese, so long as the calves are not all weaned. That seems a fair amount here. Good day to you, Hetty. Good day, sir. Well, there's a fair amount because we do take a fair yield of milk. But with these short horn cattle, it's the quality that's doubtful. They were bought on experiment, which Alec's never been happy about. But Poyser was sure I knew best. Young Alec, your cowman, uh, the very one. Sir? But he knows as much about dogs as he does about cattle. Might I have a chat with him about these new pups? Have you seen Alec, girl? I think he's in the brew house. Shall I fetch him? No, you carry on what you're doing. You're late enough already. I'll find him. Well, now, Hetty, tell me all there is to know. Sir? If I'm to run this estate someday, I must learn all there is to know. So, tell me all about the art and science of making butter. I've only been in Snowfield once, 
A dreary, bleak place, is it not? Very different from this rich farmland. They were building a cotton mill when I was there. That will have brought changes, all that new employment. Yes, I work in the mill myself. Do you indeed? And have you relations in the town? No. I had an aunt there who brought me up, but she's dead now. You were an orphan? Yes. And now the only kin I have is Aunt Poise. But you'll have many religious friends, companions. Yes, sir. You're a Methodist, I think. A Wesleyan. My Snowfield aunt belonged to the society, so I'm thankful to have been raised in it myself since I was a child. And you preach? How long have you been doing that? Four years, since I was 21. And you preached here in Hayslope the other night? I did, yes. And how did you find my congregation? Were they as quiet and attentive for you as they are for me? They were very quiet. But I saw little sign of any great work upon them. No enthusiasm, no elation. I can believe that. Our farm workers are not easily roused. They take life almost as slowly as their sheep and cows. So it seems. But there are some in Hayslope who have taken to the Methodist way. Seth Bede, for example. I know Seth well. He's a gracious and sincere young man. I heard you made a visit to his mother, Lisbeth, when her husband died. That was good of you. I was happy to do it. But I shouldn't think you'd make a convert out of her other son, Adam. I've met Adam only once. But it's true, there does seem to be a strange deadness to the word among the green pastures and still waters of places like this. They are far from dead to the word of God, Dinah. Is it not that they see the workings of God all around them, every day of their working lives in the cycle of the seasons, the cycle of birth and death? Perhaps. Certainly in towns like Snowfield and Leeds, the harvest of souls can be very rich. In those high-walled streets you walk as in a prison yard. Maybe the promise of the Lord is sweeter when the life is so dreary and bleak. Maybe. The soul may get more hungry when the body is so ill at ease. Then, when it's all made up in its blocks, we wrap it in the dock leaves, like this. Lovely. Sets it off like a primrose. And you handle it so skillfully. I think I'm quite clever at it. Even Aunt Poyser says so. Oh, but these are heavy. Do you carry it to market yourself? No, sir. Alec takes it. On the horse. He's a fine young man, is Alec. He's good with the cows. And dogs. All the beasts, really. But can he dance? Dance? Will you have promised him a dance at my party next month? I don't know as I'll be there. Of course you'll be there. It's my coming of age. Everyone will be there. Well, I look forward to that, sir. And will you dance with me? Of course, sir. I'd be proud and thankful if you noticed me. How could I not? In fact, I think I should ask now that you promise me a hand for two. If I don't get your promise now, Alec and every other fine young man will have you secured. I wouldn't think so, sir. I'm sure of it. So, I have your promise. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I thank you. And have you been enjoying this visit from your cousin Dinah? She's very kind. Very serious. She talks to you about serious things, uh, Methodist things? Sometimes. And you don't mind? No, sir. I don't really listen. Before I was 21, I'd felt no call to preach. Indeed, I spoke very little at all about my faith, my thoughts about God. I was more given to sit still, keep by myself. I could sit silent for hours with the thought of God overflowing me. Like pebbles lie bathed in a brook. Because thoughts are so great, so deep, are they not? They can be. I could make neither a beginning nor an ending of them in words. That was my way as long as I can remember. But your way changed? Yes. It was a Sunday four years ago. I'd walked to a village called Tetton Deeps. The people there get their living by working in the lead mines. There's no church, no preacher. They live like sheep without a shepherd. So I'd gone there with Brother Marlow, a fine preacher but an old man, a man who'd worn himself out with preaching and watching and praying and still worked at his trade of linen weaving. On the way, he was seized by a dizziness and his legs were uncertain. By the time we got to Hetton Deeps, he could hardly stand. He had to lie down in the first cottage we came to. I went on myself to where the people were gathered to tell them there'd be no preaching that day. I thought I might offer to read and pray with them. But when I saw them, there were old women, suspicious, glowering at me. 
raggedy, filthy children, and the hard looks of the men. Their eyes were like those of dumb oxen that had never looked up at the sky. When I saw them all... Yes? I remember my whole body trembled, and there was a movement in my soul. A movement? As if something had entered in, entered me. And I simply walked through them all, to a low wall, and I stepped onto the wall, and I spoke the words that were given to me. They were given to you? Abundantly. So that was the start of my preaching, and I've preached ever since. You know, Dinah, I think when I came here today, I'd thought of acting the pedagogue with you. What do you mean, sir? That I might teach you the error of your dissenting ways. But I think I might as well go and lecture a tree for growing in its own shape. Yes. And you never feel any embarrassment? Embarrassment? Well, you're a young woman, a lovely young woman. With men's eyes fixed on you. No. I've no room for such feelings. Oh, I don't like their eyes on me. Are you sure? Very sure. The way they squint or turn red or turn white. It's silly. And who are these silly fellows? <laughs> well, there's Luke Britton. He's from Broxton. But he comes all the way to Aislope Church just to look. The bold Luke. Not bold at all. He never speaks. <laughs> Well, he did once. He came up to me after church, and apart from that, it was a fine morning. All he had to tell me was that his grey goose had begun to lay. Not much hope for Luke, then? No, sir. So, who else dares to hope? Excuse me, sir, but I don't understand. Don't understand what? Why well, you're asking these things. As I said, if I'm to manage this estate, I must understand the ways of my tenants. And of your own staff, sir? My own staff? Like Mr Craig, the gardener. He looks. Talks as well. Old Craig? Now, that is bold. He talks far too much. Mostly about turnips and potatoes. Not flowers? Comparing you to the finest? No, sir. Mostly turnips. Cabbages sometimes. And is that why I've seen you walking through the chase? You've been up at the hall to hear old Craig sing the praises of his vegetables? <laughs> no, sir. I keep out of his way all I can when I go to the hall. So why do you go there? To see Mrs Pomfret, the lady's maid. She's teaching me tent stitch and lace mending, and we have tea, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Captain, Captain. That'll be the tea that's sent up at five. Yes, sir. Thereabouts. Captain. Oh, I'm sorry indeed. For what, Mrs. Poyser? For keeping you waiting. Oh, no need for apology. I've been uh, learning the art of butter making from Hetty. Oh, it's a skill she has, sir. True enough. One of her few. Well, Alec, we're all the way out to the five closes. And you'll know how far that is, being the place we've needed new gates for this past year. New gates? The gates we've asked your grandfather about. Is it seven times? Maybe you'd put in a word, sir. So did you make your choice, Arthur? I did. And the one I chose, young Alec confirmed, was the finest of the litter. Oh, to have Alec's approval is honour indeed. <laughs> But what kept you so long in the dairy? Mrs. Poyser took a while to fetch Alec. Thought maybe you were admiring the earthenware, the skimming dishes. No, but young Hetty was there to admire. Arthur? With my artistic eye. I'd love to paint her if I could. So long as you weren't feeding her vanity. Isn't it amazing what pretty girls there are among the farmer's daughters when the men are such clods and clowns? That particular daughter seems already to have heirs enough. Don't go filling her little noddle with the notion she's a beauty, attractive to a gentleman. You'll spoil her for a poor man's wife. Like Cabbage Craig or Grey Goose Luke. Who? Why don't we have a canter now? Is there a hurry? For fun. Ah, yes. The great advantage of conversation on horseback. Come on! A subject can be changed as easily as a trot to a canter.
I notice you've picked the prettiest way to the hall. It's the shortest, sir. But don't you think the trees here make the perfect avenue for a pretty girl to walk? Just the sort of wood you could imagine haunted by nymphs. Never seen a nymph. Never looked in a mirror? That I don't believe. Can you name them, the trees? Beech, birch. And lime. Of course, they're not managed properly. I intend to put that right when I inherit. Have Adam take care of things. Adam Bede, sir? Yes. He's not one of your admirers, too, is he? He's to marry Mary Burge, so I hear. His employer's daughter? Well, that should fit nicely. He'll marry the daughter and become Burge's partner with plenty of time to manage my woods. I don't think I know her. She's a gentle, pretty thing, but quite sallow-faced. She put on pink ribbons once and looked as yellow as a crawflower. Oh, poor thing. That way is the hermitage. Yes. You've seen it? No, sir. But I know it's there. And did you know it's my special place? The sweetest little summer house. Would you like to see it? Yes, please. Well, not now. You'll be late for Mrs. Pomfret. What is it she's teaching you? Lace mending. She learned it abroad, and tent stitch, and cutting out. Is that what you'd like to be? A lady's maid? Well, sometimes I'd like that. Sometimes not. Yes. So, you'd, uh, you'd best be on your way. Yes, sir. Do you come back by this path, or is it too lonely to walk alone in the evening? Oh, no, sir, it's never late. I always leave by eight o'clock. Well, perhaps we'll... You'd best be on your way. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Sometimes I think she's art like a pebble. No, 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 Rachel. And the air's a peacock that struts on a wall. I believe she thinks more of the tea and jam at the old than any sewing lessons. Have I not taught her all she needs that belongs to our house? Oh, you have, Rachel. There's no better housewife in Hayslope than you. Nor wife, nor aunt neither, I should think. Well, the only aunt the one's got. And I'll never deny the lass is keen on her mirror, but she's never hard. Is your cousin hard, Dinah? She's young. Aye, that's all she is. Not hard. She's more squashy, like unripe grain. But she'll make good meal yet, when she's got a husband and children of her own. And who might that be? Luke Britton? No, well, never him. There's a farmer that knows nothing of edging nor ditching, nor buying winter stock neither. Well, I doubt his judgment on yesterday's weather. Uh, Adam, now. He'll yield well in the threshing. Not one of them as is all straw and no grain is Adam. What did you make of Adam, Dinah? He and Seth are two good sons. Elizabeth was telling me how much Adam did over the years to try to help his father. Ah, well. Thia Speed. He's better out of the way than in. Rachel! God forgive me for saying it, but he did little for ten years but make trouble for them as belonged to him. Maybe he was reconciled at the end. Reconciled, lass? And pardoned. I doubt if he'd time for reconciling. All the strength since he was too drunk to drag himself out of that stream. It takes only a moment. Less than a moment. No time. God's ways are outside time. It was like she understood how we were all feeling. She's only from Snowfield, Adam. She's not some foreign gypsy that knows nothing of grief. I had a notion these Methody women would be all preaching and castigating. No, I'll have no one castigating me in my own house. Nor my dead man, neither. It wasn't that a grand turnout at the funeral? Aye. It was. Folks have good memories of father. And the latter years forgiven. I felt Dinah understood that too. About me and father. How I'd maybe been too hot and hasty with them at times. And it was preying on me. Hey, you talked to Dinah about that? No, no I didn't. I think you should get to your bed, Adam. <sighs> well then there she was. No preaching. Just making the porridge and sweeping the floor and wiping down the table. She even asked if she could move my books before she did that. Aye. She'd the place looking as good as it could. <laughs> and how are you to know? You wouldn't know if the floor had been cleaned or cut licked. But I have to say, I'm loath to see the last of her. She'll be back. I wouldn't mind having a daughter like that. Hear that, Seth? Uh, she won't have me, Adam. Of course she won't. 
She'll be all of 20 miles away in Snowfield, and she's three years older. And you, Adam, who will you bring me as a daughter? Hetty? And where have you been? At the hall with Mrs Pomfret. For your tea and jam. Learning the lace mending, Aunt Rachel. Till this time. Is it late? It's gone on for half past nine, lass. I was set out before eight. Their clock's behind, or ours is forward. Aye. And you want your clock set by gentlefolks' time and sit up burning candle and then lying in bed with a sunbake in you. I go up now, I think. Like a cucumber in a frame. You'll have your supper first, Hetty. No, I don't think so. Too full of jam. There's a bit of cold pudding in the pantry. I didn't have jam, just bread and butter. Mm, rich enough butter by the smile on your face. It's the pudding you're fond of. No, thanks, Uncle. I'll just go up. He's dining in bed. Half an hour ago. She's up at half four on her way home to Snowfield. So you've missed her with your bread and butter on a silver plate. I go to Mrs Pomfret's room. She's a lady's maid. She doesn't have silver plates. She doesn't have a clock that's right either. I'll get up to see Dinah before she goes. Good night. Good night, lass. I'll make sure she's up at half four. See if she's smiling then. Uh, I think she gets prettier every day. Aye. And who knows it better than she? Ask her again. I can't do that, Adam. Not right away. Leave it a while. I've no choice there, since she's away to Snowfield tomorrow. Then write to her. That might be a good next move. You've a graceful hand, a way with words. You might be able to say things in a letter you can't face to face. Oh, I asked her plain enough. Too plain, maybe. No. I don't think so. And her answer was... Uh... Plain? Final? No, it was as kindly as everything Dinah says. <gasps> And as heartfelt. You deserve her, Seth. Oh, Adam. There's no denying she's a rare bit of workmanship. You don't see such women turned off the wheel every day. But if anyone deserves her, you do. <laughs> You're good-hearted, good-looking too, and with plenty of sense. <laughs> Except when it comes to your methody nonsense. Yeah, it's not nonsense, Adam. Whether it is or not, it's in your favour, since she's a methody too. He, physician, heal thyself. What do you mean? Have you spoken to Hetty yet? I haven't been free to think of marrying, you know that. The way things have been. Oh. Things are different now. Have you changed, Eddie Sorrel? Let me see. Pretty as any lady I've seen at the hall. Pretty as a nymph. <laughs> what would he make of you in candlelight like this? Will you give me a smile now? Will you give me a kiss? Come in. Is it all right if I sit with you a minute, Hetty? If you like. I heard you moving. Knew you weren't in bed. I've still to brush my hair. And I'll stay till you've done that. I wanted to say goodbye. I'll see you in the morning. I'm leaving very early. And when you were late back from the hall... The clocks were different. But Aunt Rachel will get me up. I'm sure she will. Your hair's lovely. Yes. But not my hands. What's wrong with your hands? I'm all right down to the wrists, but then they're a bit coarse, don't you think? I wouldn't say they were coarse. They're working hands. Yes, working hands. Making butter and milking, picking currants and strawberries and tending the chickens is the worst. But I get one out of every brood. A chicken? <laughs> what would I do with a chicken? I get what it fetches at the market. You didn't tell me all Seth Bede said to you. That wouldn't be right now, would it? <laughs> but I did ask you to marry him. I'm sure he didn't kneel down, did he? Seth's a good man and I'm very fond of him. But not enough to marry him? No. No. He's too young for you anyway. You've got a boy's face. I'd have thought Adam would be more for you, more solid. But then he's not a methody. And his heart's already taken, I think, is it not? <laughs> you mean me? I wouldn't have him. Even if he asked what she won't. He'll marry Mary Burge, marry the daughter of the business he's in. That's the solid, sensible move for Adam Bede. So, I'll say good night. I'll pray for you, Hetty. Thank you. Before you got home tonight... I told you the clock was wrong. I know. But I was reading the Bible and you came to my mind. Why? I don't know. It happens sometimes. People I know, they're... They're brought before me. I can see them. 
even hear them, almost as plain as if they were really there. Oh, sounds witchy to me. I'd been reading about Paul leaving Ephesus when the people all wept sore and kissed him. They knew they wouldn't see him again. You're only going to Snowfield, Dinah. And I wanted you to know that if you're ever in trouble and you need a friend, you've got one in Snowfield. And if you send for her, she'll come. What makes you think I'll be in trouble? Trouble comes to us all, Hetty. In that same chapter, Paul tells us to beware that grievous wolves may enter in among us, not sparing the flock. There aren't any wolves round here. There haven't been since I don't know when. That's not what it means. I know what it means. It means you're trying to frighten me. You're trying to frighten me with your methody preaching. Not at all, just the opposite. I've grown really fond of you in my time here. And I'd want to help you if I could, and guide you to a help that's beyond all in this life. You're preaching again. I'm fond of you too, Dinah. But I'm too tired for preaching tonight. I'm sorry. It's all right. And I'll see you in the morning and kiss you goodbye. I might even weep a little. So shall I. Good night. Good night. Can't tell what her hair is like. She's never without that Quaker cap. <sighs> what did your eyes look like, Etty Sorrel, with the tears in them? Could you make yourself cry now? See how... <laughs> but if you had tears in your eyes, you couldn't... I think they almost brought a tear to his own. Tonight. And his hair, the scent of roses in it. Hattie. Good evening. Sir. Did you learn much today from Mrs. Pomfret? Yes, sir. Are you all right? Did something frighten you? Did you see something, somebody? No, sir. Here now, you're crying. What's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. Can't you tell me? I thought you would come. I'm sorry, sir. No, no, that's... I didn't intend to. I went into the hermitage, but I couldn't read. Didn't think much either. I just sat and looked out at the trees. Till it was time to go home and dress for dinner. After dinner, I thought I might ride over to Eagleton, stay there tonight and do some fishing tomorrow. But I didn't came here instead. Such a lack of resolution, eh? Hey? So, here I am. Will you give me a smile now? No? A kiss, then? Will you give me a kiss? It had lain empty for many a year, leaking, drafty, but I thought I could do something with this, make it my own hermitage, my den. The carpet's as good as any in the hall. Well, it's from the hall, but it's old, from one of the servants' rooms, I think. And I have my ottoman, uh, my bookshelves. Do you like poetry, Hattie? Oh, yes. Of course you do. Here, this is new, brand new. I try to keep up. There's a piece here about the nightingale, somewhere. Uh, ah, yes. You may perchance behold them on the twigs. Their bright, bright eyes. Their eyes both bright and full. Glistening. While many a glowworm in the shade lights up her love torch. Do you like that? Very much. A most gentle maid, who dwelleth in her hospitable home hard by the castle and at latest eve glides through the pathways. She knows all their notes, that gentle maid. Do you know all their notes, Hetty? My Uncle Poise is the best at that. He can mimic them perfect. He can do all the beasts as well. Why don't you sit down? Thank you, sir. There's one in here, the rhyme of the ancient mariner. It's like nothing else I've ever read. Not sure I can make head or tail of it, but it's a strange, 
striking thing. Maybe I'll read it to you another time. I'd like that. It's very long. Would you be able to stay that long? How long, sir? Hetty, I have a confession to make. Sir? Let me just open this window. There. Lots of fir trees here. Isn't that the cleanest, healthiest scent? You see, if you stayed that long, your uncle and aunt might... and then you might miss a visitor. What visitor, sir? A suitor. There isn't one. No one keen to marry you? I find that hard to believe. <laughs> no one I'm keen to marry. No one I will marry. I have something for you. I rode over to Rossiter for them. Open it. Oh, sir. They're earrings. Yes, sir. Is this... What? They're not real gold, are they? Of course. Gold and pearls and garnet. To apologise for making you cry. And to thank you for the kiss. And because... Because your ears are charming. Almost as charming as your eyes. Bright, bright eyes. Eyes both bright and full. And that's the confession. Is it? Yes. And now... Sir? Now... You must go home. And has Adam spoken to her, do you think? Not direct. And we're sure of that, are we? I am. Sure as I am, she's late back from the hall again. Will it be because of the mother? What did you do with the mother? Oh, it's well known Elizabeth's got little time for young women. Can't be doing with them about her. But you think she'd learn to accommodate herself? It's not to be counted on as Adam and Seth will keep bachelors forever. That would be unreasonable. Martin Poyser, you're a foolish man at times. Oh, I know that, Rachel. And I thank God daily I've you to keep me right. You've said yourself as Adam Bates a sensible man. Can't think of one at his age with more sense. And would a man of sense think himself free to marry with a father he had? Thias B took every penny out of that house to every alehouse inside ten miles. Adam had to work all hours just to keep a roof over that family. That's true. And what would a sensible man do now? Well, some might say he'd marry Mary Burge and he'd partner in her father's business where he's already foreman. Some would say that, but I say he'll talk to us about his new prospects. Prospects? Aye. Because Adam doesn't want Mary Burge. He wants our Hetty. And before you ask, I we're sure of that. <laughs> Do you know what I'm remembering, Rachel? What? Oh, you mean you can read out of Bede's mind and not your own man's? What is it, Poyser? I'm remembering nigh on 20 years oh. ago, when you were twice as buxom as your niece, and I first walked you home <gasps> from church. Hetty, may I walk you home? Yes, if you like. I'm hoping for a word with your aunt and uncle. On the back there with Mr. Craig. Uh, I'd feel easier talking with them at the farm. Did you enjoy Mr. Irwin's sermon today? A sermon's for enjoying. I always like to hear Mr. Irwin speak. At least he doesn't speak much. Aye. Short, moral and to the point. That's what I like. And the good thing is, you know he'll act up to what he preaches. He'll be the same man if you meet him tomorrow and ask him about some everyday trouble you've got. He doesn't get up in that pulpit and turn into a ranter or doctrines and notions. Here now, do you like my rose? I picked it on the way down this morning. It's a province rose. Here, take it. It's very pretty. Aye. Put it in your frock, then you can put it in water after. It smells sweet. Sweeter than those fancy stripy ones. I'll put it in my air. I noticed the captain wasn't in church today. I hope he's not ill. You're Mr Arthur? No. Never known him to be ill. In fact, he's one reason I want to talk to your uncle. Why? He's promised to make me manager of his woods. 
and to lend me money if I have a mind to start a business of my own. And what's that to do with my... Are you blushing, Hetty? No. It's this heat. I'd be glad to work under Captain Donithorn. Did you know that when he was a boy, he was as friendly to me as anyone? And now he's a grown gentleman, I think he wants to do right. See the estates well run. Leave it and the world a bit better than he found it. Maybe he's gone to Eagledale for some fishing. I don't think so. No? I heard he'd been sent to Rossiter for a day or two, some business for his grandfather. And he wants to do right. Well, I... Make the world better. Bright, bright eyes. Eyes both bright and full. Is this poetry, Hetty? It is. It most certainly is. Let's walk a bit faster. Is there a hurry? Yes. I want to pick some currants. I'm in a hurry to pick some currants. Oh, there's a good crop. Heavy bunches of them. I love the colour. Like wine with candlelight in it. And the taste. Have one of you want. I won't tell me aunt. The rose in your hair like that. What about it? It's like the ladies in the pictures up at the hall. They've mostly got flowers or, or feathers or gold things in their hair. Mostly. But then they put me in mind of the painted women outside the shows at Treadleston Fair. I'm like a painted woman, am I? No, no, I didn't mean you. A simple rose like that is different altogether. A simple wild flower for a simple girl. Simple's often the best. Look at your cousin Dinah. That simple cap of hers seemed to fit her face like the cop fits the acorn. Is that how you'd like to see me? In a black gown and one of Dinah's methody caps? No, Etty. <laughs> I'd like to see that myself. Etty Sorrel in a methody cap. I'd have you just as you are now. You've another kind of face. What could set it off better than your own hair, the way it curls like that? Doesn't need any kind of cap or feathers or flowers. Your face is like a flower itself. I'd have you just as you are. That's enough. I'm to leave some on the trees. We'll go in now. Will you bring the basket? Adam, come in, my lad, come in. Oh, Mr. Poyser. Good day to you, Adam. Yeah, and to you, Mrs. Poyser. Uh, sit down, lad. Let me take that basket from you. Where's the lady of the house? Uh, Hetty's gone upstairs for a minute. Oh, for some titivating, no doubt. You're... Mother looked a bit more herself at church this morning. Aye, she's managing. Dinah were asking after her. Dinah? Oh, we had a letter from her yesterday. And how is she? Oh, she seems well enough, happy enough. Aye, back to slaving in her mill and watching over other folks' misery. That's her happy. She was a comfort to my mother. Of course she was. I just wish she knew a little how to make herself some comfort in the world. No doubt she'll be writing to Seth and all. I know he hopes she will. Aye. And is this the spinning wheel you mentioned, Mrs. Poyser? Aye. It clicks and sticks. Just a bit of turning wanted, I think. Aye. That wouldn't take too long. If you send it to Mr. Burgess's shop in the morning, I could have it done for Wednesday. To Burgess, Adam? I haven't the proper lathe at home. But that's one of the plans I'm thinking on. Oh, you'll have a need to make plans now, with the old man gone. And the freedom to make them. Aye. It's a pretty wheel, that. I'd enjoy getting it just right. I've done such little things in the past, fixing machines, cabinet making. I enjoy it. And there'll be a profit in it. Uh, that's right, because it's more a matter of workmanship than material. Seth and I have talked of taking on more of that kind of work, a side business for us. There's a man in Rossiter says he'll take all we can turn out. A side business, eh? Aye. I'm still the foreman at Burgess. That may be his partner one day. Oh, I don't count on that, Mrs Poyser. But young Captain Donithorne, I think I can count on him. He's promised that when he becomes landlord, there'll be good paying work on the estate. More or less promised. So, you've got new prospects to think on. Aye. New prospects, Rachel? Hetty, have you gone mad? <sighs> not mad. Methody. Am I not pretty? Pretty? I thought you were a ghost. Because Adam said he'd like to see me dressed like this. I, I didn't say that. Said the cap would suit me like an acorn's cup. I said it suited Dinah. And the simple black gown. Simple's the best, or ugly even. I only said you'd look just as pretty in plain clothes. And do I? Aye. There. Ugly is prettier. If I see Dinah's cap again, I want her own face under it. Black, ugly gown. Gown both ugly and black. Enough now. Look at you. And your hands still red and damp with currant juice. 
I thought the basket were light. You only ate a few. As well send the wasps to pick them. Pink and white. They are quite white. White and pink. Like she'd seen a ghost. And these delicate ribbons. The methody ghost of Dinah. Delicate little knots. The grey ghost of all farm. So easily undone. And Adam went pink. Adam Bede. Still trying to smile. What was Adam doing there? He was there to mend a spinning wheel. Wouldn't you like to see me in black and grey? In anything, you'd be lovely. Do you think so? In anything. In... How easily I'm done. I'm not... Hetty? I'm not sure. Should I stop? Hetty. So white and pink. Adam Bede by George Eliot was dramatised by Robert Forrest and directed by Patrick Rayner. Thomas Arnold played Adam, Anne Scott Jones was Lisbeth, John Kilty was Seth, Victoria Liddell, Dina, Richard Greenwood, Arthur, Noreen Layton, Rachel, Crawford Logan was Mr. Irwin, and James Bryce was Poyser. And next week, will the captain's military career, or someone else, prevent a marriage to Hetty? Adam Bede continues at the same time.